So, greetings, and welcome to today's educational program, part three of our 12-part lecture series on managing for quality. This one is Designing Quality as an Inclusive Business System by Greg Watson. This is your moderator, Doug Wood, with the ASQ's Quality Management Division. So today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Dr. Gregory H. Watson. Please join me in welcoming him. Dr. Watson has degrees in management, law, and industrial engineering. He's an 18-year ASQ fellow and past chair of year 2000. He received the ASQ Distinguished Service Medal, plus the Lancaster Medals, Crosby, and Ishikawa Medals. He's been named an honorary member in 17 national quality associations. Dr. Watson delivered speeches to 20 or more ASQ national and divisional conferences. He's done it twice for the quality management division itself. A former quality executive with Hewlett Packard, Compact Computer, and Xerox. Andy has coached executives in quality transformations at Nokia Mobile Phones, Toshiba, Exxon Mobil, and over 20 other companies. He's the only Westerner to be awarded a Deming Medal by the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers. The uh, W. Edwards Deming Award for Dissemination and Promotion Overseas in 2009. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Watson. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and just a, a check, can, can you hear me, Doug? I can hear you fine. Okay, great. So I want to begin uh, tonight's uh, session by having a uh, brief review of a little bit about what we've learned. There have been some implications in the first two lectures uh, regarding quality uh, system structure. And, and so uh, to get everybody on the page, I realize that we have quite a few people who haven't listened to the webinars, at least online, uh, while we've been doing them. So I thought I would begin with this. Now, many of you will remember Dr. Duran had distinguished between little Q and big Q. And what we should think of in terms of little Q is its operational focus. It's typically about managing the quality function. And, and the positioning is it's a quality strategy. How do we de develop and deploy quality in an organization? Now, most executives in organizations believe that is not a job for them, that this is a job that is something that they will delegate to the managing person responsible for the quality system. On the other hand, big Q, the emphasis here is strategic, and it's managing for quality results of the organization. And the positioning for this is quality as a strategy. And this is indeed where we're, we're talking about how we use quality to position the organization or differentiate it from its competition. This is a job for the executive function. And so we start seeing this two distinct ways of looking at quality activities. And this language of quality we see uh, can be used to unite different people. Each level of management has different types of languages. The senior management talks the language of money. The workers talk the language of products and processes. And middle management has to be bilingual so they can interpret both and translate the functions from one to the other. In addition to this, we also see that there are different disciplines who have their own languages. So in order to get rid of a Tower of Babel situation, we have to figure out how do we build a common culture and a common language for the organization. Now, when we look at the organization, we see organizations tend to have three levels. And the organizations are existing to create a purposeful outcome. And that is the quality intent that is inherent in the existence of an organization and the charter that it was given to exist as a business by uh, its government, uh, r r ruling government, whether we're here in Finland or we're talking about uh, one that uh, is uh, uh, in the nations or in a state where we get the license to operate. Now, most executives do not believe that pursuit of quality strategy is part of their work. However, if you ask them, do you believe that you should have more profit or that you should have profitable growth of the organization? They say yes. So they will define quality in different terms in their organization, and they will be using a different language. So we have to understand the metaphysics of quality. So quality strategy is consistency in product and service performance. It's also evidence-based performance to requirements. However, quality as strategy is the competitive level of offering that's being given to the marketplace for our products, or our services and goods. And so that's the difference that we see between these two different components. And when we want to understand this, we see we have 
talked in the past about a transcendental definition of the quality of concept. So this is a metaphysical, the highest level of abstraction. And we've, we've seen that we define quality as a relentless pursuit of goodness coupled tightly with the persistent avoidance of badness. And so the question then becomes, how do we operationalize that abstract concept in a real world commercial and production environment? And we see that this is actually broken down into three different types of components. And so we can define then a product quality strategy definition, a service quality definition, and a process quality definition. And then the question becomes, how do we define those and operationalize those elements? So for instance, for product quality, we see we're focusing on the actual entity. What is the content of the goods or the products that we are delivering to the marketplace? So this definition, similar to Duran's definition for quality, is fitness for use by the customer in the intended application and the actual environment. So it's dealing with the products, the results delivered. It's judged by the customers. And the ideal should be fault-free operation with a cost-effective outcome. And so the challenge then comes, how do I then specialize that particular definition to my company? Who are our customers? What are their regulations and so forth? So if we are a, a product delivery company, or we would be then trying to understand how can we define this further and make it very specific so we can, in the organization, understand exactly what those delivery requirements are. On the other hand, if we're a service organization, we're gonna focus on the actual experience that the customer has. So the service quality definition is gonna be considered to think of the consistent delivery of desired service levels over an extended period of time and across all locations. So in other words, if I'm going to a hotel chain, and I go to Ritz-Carlton, I expect the same service at every hotel I go to. If I have a lesser quality hotel, I won't be living up to that standard, but I will still can, uh, expect that consistency because the brand is the same and the brand should be the guarantee that you will get the consistency that it speaks of for the service level agreement that it has with its customers. So we'll look at service requirements, reliable results delivered over time and location. Again, it's judged by the customers and we're looking for mistake-free operation as well as cost-free, cost-effective outcomes uh, in terms of the, the business results. Finally, if we're talking about process quality definitions, we're actually looking at the actual activity. What are the things people are actually doing in their day-to-day -day business? And here the focus is on maximizing the level of productivity relative to the customer demand with minimal cost, waste, inefficiency, or loss. So again, we'll look at the process requirements. We need reliable results, and we have to understand then what is happening with this in terms of the judgment of the customer about how our processes are working in terms of the impact on them. Internally, we should see waste and, and loss-free operations as well as cost-effective operations in terms of the outcomes. So making quality real to its benefactors is what we're trying to do. So we have to decide how will we define quality? So this operationalizing of quality must be managed carefully so people know what it is, what they should pursue, and what they should avoid. Your special definition in your organization must be informed by the transcendental definition and that deliverable specific definition, but it also must consider industry practices and external constraints, regulatory environments, et cetera, and also it should encourage employee commitment and motivate their uh, pursuit of quality in their day-to-day -day activities. Now, when we look at this organization, we have defined it as three levels of Gemba. Gemba one is the worker level, Gemba two is this business level, and Gemba three is the executive or, or the uh, uh, overall uh, governance level of the organization. And as we look at those, we're gonna see that, that things change across those three levels. And, and is this change really the same as we look internally at the organization, as we look externally? So comprehensive change needs to be integrated across the whole organization. It has to be inclusive and engage everybody in that process to make it work. And we saw that we will build this over time. We need to start with the sound foundation of standards. This is one of the lessons that we learned out of the Toyota management system, where Taiichi Ono says that if you begin uh, to develop a quality system, you have to begin with standard work. 
What is that standard work? And the first time we evaluate standard work, we go through a process of understanding. That's our first cycle of improvement. We study the situation. After we've studied it, we can document the current state. After we've documented the current state, we can see it in enough detail, we can go through simplification. And Taichi Ono suggested that we go through these states as quickly as possible and keep in encouraging the cycle. Don't wait for perfection in the standard, but keep finding it and finding other things that need to be improved. And ultimately, we will get to the limit of what we can do with the standard work, and we then switch into a PDCA cycle for optimization. So this is then one of the, the ways that we can build this uh, synergy in our organization. Now the question becomes, how do we actually manage that process? Well, we start seeing that there exists actually a portfolio of multiple uh, generation business improvement actions that happen at all levels. So at the work process level, we've seen we have continual improvement. That's a deliverable level of performance for products and services. At the business area level, that's the system level. We're looking at how the business system comes together as a, as a series of processes that deliver uh, outputs of the organization. We can start seeing we need breakthrough types of, of step function changes. And those are going to be generated by technology and, and uh, changing the way we look at markets in, in the broadest sense of technology. And finally, at the leadership level or the governance level of, of the organization, we're going to be doing transformations. And those transformations are about changing the organization and the way its culture operates. And across all three of those types, we are actually managing a continuous state of structural change. In this, we see that managers improve processes and leaders improve the entire system. So we are going to see that there's a difference between management and leadership as we start taking a look at this organizational structure and as we start building a quality system around it. Now what we see in each of these GEMBA, we saw this in our last uh, lecture, we saw that there is, is a different focus in each of the GEMBA. So in GEMBA 1, the worker level, the focus is on the customer or the next process. We're looking at work productivity, we're doing things, operating things, and we're managing for flow efficiency. So our performance approach is looking at quality, eliminating waste, looking at efficiency, eliminating time. The idea is, can we get it right the first time? And we do this through a team approach using work groups or quality circles. At GEMBA 2, the focus is on the external customer. And here we're prioritizing our daily management work to align to the priorities of delivering to customers. The dominant function here is supervising or managing, and we worry about productivity across all of those functional groups of the organization. The performance growth then becomes productivity growth as the objective of the organization. The idea is, the quality mindset is, serve the customer, put the customer first. And the approach is program management or project improvements. The next, and GEMPA 3, we're talking about the ownership level of the organization. So this is governance. And here we're talking about not work priority, but work profitability. This dominant function tends to be command and control. It's directive, and then the question is how it becomes directive and, and how it uses input but it is directive in saying, these are how we will assign resources, this is how we will give decision rights to make this organization work, and we measure performance then in terms of financial growth. The objective of the quality mindset is to get the business results. And here the team approach is committees or councils. And so together, this whole system of changes uh, from an external perspective appears as continuous improvement. So we have continual improvement at the worker level, breakthrough at the, at the manager level, and transformation when we look at the holistic organization. So now part two is saying, how do we evaluate or assess quality management system design? And so we see we have these three levels, and the first thing we can, we can observe is that deliverables going out of the organization go to markets, whereas at the bottom of this organization, we see that we have workplace and this is where tangible things are happening. Intangible things are the service component of the organization or the deliverables going in transportation or logistics systems. And we start seeing all businesses have those upper levels of the organization. They have deliverables, or whether it's a product or service, and they have a service component, whether it's also a product or service. However, only manufacturing will have all three of this. And so, um, 
this is, is the uh, structure that we have, uh, and we recognize then that all organizations are a service organization at heart. So if, if we try to distinguish and we say, you know, you're a manufacturing organization, well, embedded in every manufacturing organization is also a service organization. It's not as uh, dominant as it would be if you were in only a service organization, like in transportation, hotels, uh, uh, rental cars, or, or restaurants, or, and so forth. But it is also a dominant component. And we look across this, we see that we have different quality activities. And so there are four dominant quality activities we think about. So quality assurance, where we're talking about uh, uh, inhibiting bad performance, so we don't want it to degrade below a particular level. So this is avoiding the badness. Quality control is maintaining stable uh, performance at the state of statistical control. Uh, and, and so this is, is what uh, Duran is talking about as uh, detecting and, and correcting adverse changes, which is also avoidance of badness, but it's adding stability to the process. Quality improvement is extending performance to the upper limits of its potential. So here it's pursuing goodness. And quality planning is taking, can we take this process to a higher level of performance than it's seen before. And this is also delivering increased levels of goodness. So we take a look at this, we see that standards focused activities are QA and QC. And this has been sort of what we, we see as we develop our mindset about building a quality organization. Improvement oriented activities are quality improvement and quality planning. And so this is what we do as we're taking a look at forward looking quality. How do we create the future? So QA, QC are basically backward looking about how do we maintain the current state today and make sure that we've done it as, as well or better than the past, whereas the uh, quality improvement and quality planning are saying, can we create better performance in the future state? Now, Dr. Ishikawa identified this uh, sort of structure of quality uh, using this, this graphic. And he identified that there is a performance measure, that's this left-hand arrow with the black, uh, the black arrow on it, and it has a statistical distribution. And for sake of argument, we're just gonna show it as normal, although it may not be normal. And so better is at the top, and so we see at some level, there's an unacceptable to customer, and that's what we would say is the lower specification limit. Below that, it's out of tolerance. So the job of QA, according to Ishikawa, was prevent us from going below that level assure the quality, minimum quality to customers. The job of QC is saying, can we get this process to a state of control so it is stable in, within the, the center boundary of that limitation? So this is operating as a control chart. The job of quality improvement is if we see that performance measurement indeed is better at a higher level, can we drive this to a level that is at the upper uh, end of the distribution of quality performance that's been designed into our process? And the job of quality planning is saying, can we actually shift the distribution to a higher level of performance? And many times people will talk about design for Six Sigma, which is designing to a higher level of performance than we've actually targeted in the past. So if we take a systems approach to quality management, what we see is it includes quality assurance, plus quality control, plus quality improvement. And that's what we tend to mean by quality management. If we talk about quality development, this is a term that's not used much in the Western world, but it is being emphasized in China by the, the national organization that's talking about uh, how to apply quality in, in state-owned enterprises. And this is about forging a pathway towards the future. So they define quality development as quality planning, plus the breakthrough improvement that will give the step function, plus quality by design, which we would, can think of as the designed for Six Sigma type of, of idea, and that equals quality development. So that is how we choose quality for the future. And if we want to think about a term that was used at Xerox in the late 1990s, actually used in the 1970s, uh, and also then re reinvigorated in the 1990s, it was leadership through quality. And this is where we're going to get to. How do we do managerial engineering of business as a system? So how will quality continue to mature in the future? And here we see that we have quality management as a foundation and all of those components, it doesn't go away. We have quality development and its components, and plus we're gonna add then the element of quality culture. 
And, and this is what we're talking about when we're talking about managing for quality or we're talking about generating leadership through quality. So managing for quality and leadership for quality are, are related concepts, but leadership for quality says we are at the front end. Uh, in, in Japanese, this uh, word is dantotsu, becoming the best of the best. So in the third part of, of our set presentations, we want to talk about how do we engineer design of a business system. And now uh, this gets a little bit more complex because we have to think how the business operates. Well, we see that the business actually it does indeed operate at three levels. There is this enterprise level. That is the holistic end-to-end -end business at the highest level. This is the governance of function. And this is seeing everything of the whole business group. The business level is the viewpoint of a particular product line, service area, unit division, or a product category, depending on the company. And the operations level is the discrete business uh, activity, whether it's research and development, uh, manufacturing factory, or, or production operations, distribution center sales, or service. So each of those has a different level of the organization. They, they also have a, a different uh, set of uh, objectives, different customers, different decision processes, and each has its own kit of analysis tools. So we see as we look at this, Senior management is emphasizing the organization's mission in the short term. It prepares resources to gain process strength and achieve long-term vision. So this is about the strategic component of quality. Middle management is focusing on coordinating resources, collaborating to assure the flow and that the, the pull signal actually that comes from the customer is actually moving smoothly without bottlenecks in the organization. And operational management is then managing each of those components that delivers that smooth flow to make sure it's happening without any lags in the process, without any uh, uh, friction in the process or constraints in the process, uh, and that it's not leaking in terms of losing materials or resources as a loss function. That means it is it's operating free of waste, uh, it's operating efficiently, and so there is no cost loss actually happening in that type of business. So that means that each level has its own focus. Strategy is the focus of the enterprise. Serving the customer is the focus of the business. And executing the daily operational function is the job of operations. Each level also has its own objectives. So the objectives of the enterprise are to choose where it will go for the future. So we will find the future. We will fund the future. We will create the programs that deliver the future. The objective of the business is uh, to define the business area and how to best develop that particular business to realize the future. And the objectives of the operation levels are very straightforward. Can I actually do this effectively, economically, and efficiently in the work that we're doing in the, the daily management process? So as we're looking at this, we start seeing the management of an organization has to have different ways of looking and taking responsibility. And we can see one way of indicating this is how they spend their time. So senior management, for instance, should be spending about 50, 60% of their time on strategic issues. They should be spending maybe 30 uh, to 40% of their time looking at improvement activities, and maybe five to 10% of their time on routine work. So that says they are the ones who are, are creating the future. Middle management will spend maybe 10 to 20% of their time on strategic, about another 10 to 20% of the time on improvement projects, and the rest of their time on routine work of making sure the business is operating. At the routine level of the organization, workers should spend 20% of their time on improvement, and then 80% of their time on actually doing the work. And as a good benchmark for comparison, if we take a look in Toyota, we see that the, the work day for a factory worker is 10 hours long. Eight hours of that is time spent on production, and two hours of that is time spent on other activities, whether it's improvement or it's set up uh, and, and so forth, uh, personal time, allowing for lunch breaks and so forth. So we start seeing that, that basically 80% of their time is spent in routine work and 20% is spent in, in uh, improvement activities or other activities. Now how this works in an organization is that the value-adding work is what's happening at this frontline level. 
And so here we're focusing on the process. This is worker capacity. So that is process work. The dominant type of waste we will see there is MUDA. If we go to the middle part of this organization, we see this is coordination, and it's a function that's coordinating across. So its dominant type of waste is MUDA, which is actually eliminating flow waste. And we go to the top level of the organization, and the governance function, we see that it is providing organizational direction, and its most dominant category of waste is MURI, or irrational waste, from bad management decision processes. So that's what we talked about in our last lecture, this, this idea of MURI waste, or, or bad management decision processes. And what we saw in this is that if we take a look at those, if management is saying we need to have a change, what happens is if they say we need to have a change, it's easy for them to say and kick off the program. Then at the middle level of the organization, we deploy a team to make that happen, and the work comes down to the worker level. And so here is where we actually have to make this, this uh, come to, to provide all the detail and create that, that process. So for instance, if we're saying we're going to implement SAP, management isn't doing the work, the team is then farming it out to different groups to take care of it, and it comes down to the workers in the organization to figure out how do they actually do the conversion of their processes to that IT system. But once we do that, management then realizes there's another change we have to have. We've changed our processes sufficiently, and to get the context right, we have to have an update to our quality management system. Again, it's easy to say, the detail is out there, but who does all the work? Now we've changed the quality management system. Now we have to realign our performance measurement system to it. And then maybe we have to fix our reporting system. And what we start seeing is that this mandatory sequence of projects coming from management will actually cause us to have a loss of capability at the worker level because the value adding work they were doing is being displaced by this uh, uh, project work that's being assigned so they lose their productive capacity and it then creates personal frustration and that reduces their productivity. So this is a challenge that we want to see. So how does quality uh, address the activities uh, and, and uh, how does it actually create the reasons for organizing? Well what we see is the laws of physics are applied in, in organization structures to Japan. So every organization has an intended purpose, a purposeful objective. Around that, we see there's a transfer of energy, a system of activities. And that system of activities is structured so that it can create the purposeful outcome. And that's the fundamental idea of these three levels of the organization. So we have strategic management giving us direction, change management getting us ready to do things that are different than the daily management system. And the daily management system feeds the change management system with feedback loops and data that tells us this is what we have to do to make change happen. Now, how do we actually do that? Well, Dorothy Leonard is a psychologist from Harvard, and she's talked about different sources of core capabilities of an organization. She says the traditional ones are technical systems, personnel skills and competence, and then the management systems. But she says, we can create a dysfunctional state called core rigidity. That means we don't change. To overcome that, she says, focus on a fourth dimension, which are the organizational values and norms. And those are the cultural issues. And she divided this into two different categories. She says, core rigidity is mechanistic. It's mindless. It's static. It doesn't move. It, it avoids taking risk. It's closed. It, it's collusive, it's, it's opaque, you can't actually see what's happening. Core flexibility, on the other hand, is innovative, adaptive, it's mindful, it's dynamic, it thinks about this open environment and how do we actually hold people accountable for the quality of work because we can see what's happening and everything is transparent so we can all see it and we can manage risk in a much more mindful way and embrace that risk in the things we do. And so as we look at the management system, we see there's two different things happening. So we have in Gemba 1, the management system. Gemba 2 and above, we have the leadership system. The management system is focused on action. It's asking questions like where and how. And it's asking questions how much in terms of tangible results. So that is looking at target achieving performance. The leadership section is looking at planning 
and it's trying to develop the strategy. What should we do for the future? Why should we do it? And that's goal-directed. And again, it's asking the question, how much should we do? How far do we take this forward into the future? And so as we start taking a look, there needs to be a strategic dialogue between leadership and management in order to make things happen. So leadership is driven by purpose. It's responding to the values and culture set up and the external competitive environment. And here, the, the primary tool is creating the vision. On the other hand, the management level has an individual mission. It also is responding to its values and cultures, but it is not looking at, at the, uh, the competitive environment. It's trying to ask, how can we have significant breakthroughs in terms of what we're doing beyond the continual improvement process? And it's charged with producing the results. So coupled together, the leadership system and the management system have to operate seamlessly to be able to get the results of the organization. And so we talk about the big Q function that, that Duran was talking about. We see the big process of quality, this, this up here, these are all the activities we see in the strategic elements of quality. Now, in a subsequent uh, lecture, we'll talk about this in terms of Potion Connery and how we manage at that level. Uh, but I don't want to get into that yet, so we're going to build up to that in a future lecture. But we see also then that the delivery of that strategic uh, process is actually the strategic content. So most organizations, when they think of strategy, they don't think about a process for developing it. They think of what is the strategy or the content. And so when we're talking about strategic quality, this is what we're talking about. The process uh, by which we make the considerations to find the future, and then the future that we determine that we want to formulate, as well as the improvement projects that we say, these will be the implementation activities that will create that future change. Now, that strategic process is driven down into the daily management system. So strategic quality introduces change into the system. And here, we're going to change in the operational level. So at that level, we see business excellence operating in this GEMBA 2-3. And this is the responsibility of the leadership team. GEMBA 1 is the daily management system. And this is where we have our quality standards, like ISO 9000. And so here, we start seeing the components of daily management. Uh, are, are listed here. And again, these are the processes we would find in each organization, and we should be finding these embedded into GEMBA 1 of the organization. Now, when we take a look at how we structure a business, and we see these three levels, we say there is actually a ge generic management process operating across those three. So at the top level, the enterprise, we see that we are balancing the world of facts and the world of possibilities. Facts are those observations we can have externally that will then shape what we can do. The world of possibilities are the potential changes that could influence us. And the way we manage those is we have to create some scenario analysis that says, in these sets of circumstances, how would we actually manage differently? And in those scenarios, we should evaluate our critical assumptions, how we define the business, where do we have vulnerabilities? And we should do a discontinuity analysis. And then that drives into the business case we create for the future. It's based on the values of the system and the vision, where we want to go. And the business case then is then transferred down into the business level. And for that business case, we will create a strategic plan. And that strategic plan has to be responsive to this SWOT analysis to understand where we can go, how we can shape it. It will have business imperatives. These are things that are directed by management that must change. And it will also have the performance indicators. So this is where we get the Y as a function of X part of uh, a Six Sigma change equation. And then when we go to the top level of the organization, we're only consolidating those Ys into uh, performance metrics. And we'll talk about that when we talk about accounting systems and how we actually make that transformation. But notice on the right-hand side of the strategy are quality improvement, capital investment, information system strategy, and HR plans. And these are all of the support vehicles that should be aligned with the strategy for how we're going to manage and change the business. And then that whole system is then cascaded into an annual plan. For the strategic plan, whatever planning horizon we have, what will be our, our next set of activities that we're going to do? And from the annual plan, we develop a budget. We also develop implementation plans for change strategy. And there, in that bottom right-hand box, it says, 
business management, that's where we manage the business. So we, we manage processes, we do problem solvings when they go wrong, we use project management to do implementation of changes, we have a review cycle that is operating at the worker level, self-assessment, there's an operating review where we're talking about managing the numbers, which usually happens every month and quarter, and then a presidential review, which is where things are going so bad that the organization has to come down and intervene at the local level. And then we execute corrective action and preventive action to, to fix that system. And finally, coming out of the annual plan is the feedback performance back to our world of facts. And so this is gonna be the challenge that we, we have to have. How do we actually create that business as a system? Now, linking and aligning that, there are these uh, set of seven particular uh, characteristics or management factors. So we have to have a shared vision, integrated performance management system, standardized risk management, common approach to process management, unified objectives management process, uh, a collective uh, core cultural foundation, and a consistent approach to continual improvement. So all of those are elements that we have to structure, and we'll see these coming to play in how we build a Hoshin Conry system in a future lecture. So part four is how do we develop business as a system? And so uh, as we're looking at this, we're going to talk about the business functions. Well, 1987 was a very important year. There were five things that happened in that year. So market-driven quality uh, came out as a function of Bradley Gale's um, uh, The Profit Impact of Market Strategy. In Chapter 6, it was uh, clearly identified that quality is a driver of profitability in organizations, and that became accepted. 1987 was when the first issue of ISO 9000 was released. 1987 was when Paichi Ono's Workplace Management Book was, was released into uh, the uh, workplace in English, so we had it available. Uh, 1987 was when Motorola announced its Six Sigma project management process, measure, analyze, improve, control. There was no define at that time. And also 1987 was when business excellence was created in terms of the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. Now, for several years, there was a lot of confusion. I'm going to say maybe 10 years, uh, maybe even as long as 12 years or 15 years. What is the right pathway to go in terms of quality? How do we put that all together in the right way? So this is a, a one approach to business excellence. We see that we have enablers and results. This happens to be EFQM because it's what I teach most often. But basically at this level, it's pretty much the same as Baldrige Award. And so we start seeing that we can embed Six Sigma in all of those components, but this is a very high level approach to change. And so as we look at that model that we had for purpose, we see, oh wait, this strategic element is really addressed by business excellence. Lean Six Sigma is how we manage change projects that get embedded into the daily management system, which we document with ISO 9000 and work instructions. And so we start seeing that this quality system is actually an integrated approach. We have a compliance level at the bottom. We have an aspiration level at the top, which gives us our direction. We have a strategic plan and we then issue projects and these can be Six Sigma projects or other kinds of projects and we, we conduct those projects and then as we complete them, we benchmark internally and externally and we do self-assessment to see what should we do next. And step by step, we walk this planning process to achieve a higher level of excellence by eliminating waste and then pursuing the goodness. Now, many people have said, you know, you have to choose one of these. But if we actually take a look, what's in ISO 9000 standards? We have a list of tools and methods uh, in that. We also have a list of methods and tools for Six Sigma and a set of methods and tools for business excellence. And when we put them side by side, what we see is there is not a duplication. They are reinforcing of each other and it says we should build the quality system together. And what we see is that if we build that system, everyone has a unique responsibility. And so each person is responsible for improving in their own way. Workers are responsible for improving the quality of their own work. Supervisors are responsible for improving quality of the end-to-end -end workflow across their process. Functional managers are responsible for cross-functional integration in a collaborative work environment. Executives are responsible 
are responsible for assuring resources have been allocated properly for improvement, and the executive in charge must have an unrelenting intent to pursue improvements of all kinds. So we see now the big Q, little Q that Duran was talking about, we can actually fill in the blocks with a lot more detail. So when we talk about strategic quality, it's about the culture, it's about the competition, it's about how we do renewal, how we cascade and align the organization's change management process, and how we communicate the same messages to everybody. The operational quality is about the local thing. It's the competence we put in people, capabilities we build into the process, compliance we built into the products, certification that we're following standards. It's conformity or learning, and it's also the corrective preventive action process. Now, as we look at this, we were used to big Q, little Q, but I've also observed we actually have other big and little things. So we have big R, little R, big S, little S, big E, little E, big T, little T, and big C, little C. And, and what do we mean by that? Well, we can establish some, some uh, ideas about this. So big and little resources. So big resources are the, the assets of the organization as a whole. It's how we manage corporate money, basically. Little resources are how we manage the expenses, how we manage the cost, how we manage the training and things happening in the organization. Those are the little things that get budgeted down to the lowest level. When we come to standards, we have big S and little s. Big S are these global standards, certification for compliance, third-party audit, and so forth. Little s are the work standards, those things that define how we do the daily management system. And it's this little s standards that Ichiano said, this is actually the foundation of the Toyota production system. It's not the big s standards. Those are what we give as guarantees to external pay people that we're actually doing things right in the little s environment. We talk about efficiency. Big E efficiency is the cooperative structure of the organization operating efficiently across the different boundaries. Where little e efficiency is talking about cycle time efficiency, how we manage within the work process. Talk about teamwork. Big T teamwork are the cross-functional teams, executive teams, management account, so the strategic components of teamwork. Little T is what happens at the group level, project, project management, quality improvement, firefighting circles, quality circles, Kaizen events, and so forth. We also see culture. Big C is cultural work, uh, the organizational work culture, how we're managing and then little c is about the local work, work culture. That may be uh, changed slightly from the big culture because it's going to be localized for a particular national culture or it's going to be localized according to uh, how we actually manage in a particular society. So we'll see local adaptations of standard operating procedures within the units because things are managed differently in a different country. So. We've come to the, the sort of the end of our, our time, and I still see, think we have a little time left for, uh, for questions, but I have just a couple of, of, of closing comments. In order to have a system like this, to build the culture, we have to create a quality mindset in our people. And we think about this, what should be the things we do to create practices that will drive a quality mindset? So these are the elements that support a humanistic quality culture customer sensitivity, respect for humanity, teamwork, consensus-based decisions, responsibility management, process orientation, doing what makes sense, standard work, statistical thinking. So we have to add those things into our organization. And those elements then have to be uh, assumed by each individual as a personal responsibility to deliver customers quality results. So for leaders, that means develop an organizational culture where everyone is actively engaged in assurance of quality for customers. For managers, it's delegating responsibility for quality through a set of consistent actions that encourage the workers to take personal responsibility for the quality of the work. For workers, it's accepting personal responsibility for achieving quality outcomes and taking ownership of their standard work process that achieves the results consistently. And when we do these things, we will find that we are actually creating that quality system to our individual efforts. So that's the end of my uh, prepared comments. So I think we have some time for some questions, Doug. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This uh, this was a wonderful talk. Thank you for doing this, Greg. We we do have a few questions already. Uh, they've been coming in during your talk. Uh, okay. Back at uh, about 20 after the hour, Roger had a question. He says, we're an engineering services firm. We produce engineering products, analyses, system designs, reports. We do not do construction. Can we use production concepts? I, I think later on you did cover some of that, but do you want to add a little bit to that about the a services business? Yeah, it, I, I will take this organization as an engineering services organization. And so uh, as a service organization, you can indeed use many of the same concepts, uh, but they're going to be modified. Uh, so you, you don't have the tangible activities, but you do have intangible activities. Your output, for instance, is drawings. Okay, so you're providing drawings, or you're providing drawings that people execute in in a physical world in terms of constructions of plants or whatever it is you're you're engineering. So your inventory, if you will, are the drawings that you have. The quality improvement is going from uh, draft drawings into finalized drawings. And, and that, that whole process that you're talking about, how you manage that documentation becomes your life cycle management process. So all of that can be conceptualized in terms of how you deliver that type of, of engineering function. So that would be how I would interpret that uh, in terms of uh, how to approach quality for your organization. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, we have another one here. Um, oh my, hold my, <laughs> we're getting a lot of questions. Okay, uh, a little bit after that, we got a question of uh, what is, uh, what kind of tools or systems would you use in a service industry to move, to be used from Gemba 1 up to Gemba 3? Any tools or systems you would recommend for a service? I recommend no tools. <laughs> okay. Well, we have to realize, we'll come back to this in Hoshin Conry. When you're taking a look at organizations, to get Gemba 1 right, it's about getting the culture right. It's about getting the sensitivity of management right. It's about understanding how performance measurement systems actually work and not getting stuck in lame ways of doing things like, financial management systems, which is what, what most Gemba 3 organizations get stuck in. As you come down to Gemba 2, and you're talking about the flow of the system, you really are talking about a set of measurements around flow management and pull. And so you need to take a look at that. When you come to Gemba 1, you're talking about concrete situations. And no matter what you're talking about, methods and tools are the last thing you have. So the, the best thing to think about is building a strong measurement system and understanding how that measurement system will actually link and align. I know there was one PowerPoint slide I went through pretty quickly where I said, here are the, the seven ingredients that link and align the organization. One of those is the measurement system. And, and when I'm talking to and, and coaching master black belts, I tell them that there's three things that they need to do as master black belt projects for their organization. And one of those is that they have to have a sound understanding of, yeah, that's the slide right there. They have to have a sound understanding of uh, the measurement system. Have we actually built a Y as a function of X measurement system, or if we haphazardly let everybody choose their own metrics? Do not do a balanced scorecard. I'll come back and talk about that in another lecture. But the balanced scorecard is wrong. That is not what Japanese systems are doing. That is not what a sound business system is doing. We need predictive analytics, not balance. So if we can't predict future states, those measures don't help us. So that's a, another thing to think about. And, and, and so as we start getting to discussion of methods and tools, we get back to Gemba 1 all the time. So it, it's not about seeking methods and tools. Uh, in the very first lecture, I quoted a Japanese haiku from the 1600s, and his name is Bashi. And he says, do not do what the masters did. Instead, seek what the masters sought. So it's not about understanding methods and tools. It's about understanding how do we focus differently? How do we concentrate? And how do we develop our organization? And it's about the questions we need to ask. How do we guide ourselves differently? This is particularly important for the quality management community, as in the next 20 years, we will be fully digitized. 
And so we can't use the old tools and methods. We have to invent new tools and methods that work in that digital age. And that's going to be a real challenge. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I love this forward thinking. Uh, the balanced scorecard was what, 16 years ago? Well, and the balanced scorecard was actually stolen uh, from analog devices who created a corporate court of scorecard that was published in Quality Progress in 1988 by Art Schneiderman, the quality manager there. And in that article, he says, I learned about this from Yokogawa Hewlett Packard. <laughs> and so it came across and they didn't do, I mean, Art Schneiderman modified what Hewlett Packard did and he made no apology for it. That's fine. But the H, uh, HBR guys never went back to see what HP did or they would have realized that it's not about balance, it's about creative, a predictive system based on the processes of the organization. Yeah, I, I, I think maybe they were responding to so many companies that were using financials alone. Yes, exactly. Strategy. And, and that was their point. Well, very few companies just use financials alone today. They've realized that that's a short-sighted approach. True, but they okay. don't have predictive analytics. No, they, many have not gone there yet. Okay, yep. so I've got a couple of questions here that are sort of together, one from Zachary and one from Winifred. Um, Zachary says, if upper management has not been successful over time to adjust the quality culture to an appropriate level, is there a methodology that is recommended for a bottom-up approach? And Winifred says, how do management levels encourage leadership to buy into process quality improvement? I think those two sound related. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, this reminds me of the interview I did with Peter Drucker. I, I, I mentioned this in an earlier uh, uh, webinar. When I was the, the uh, president of ASQ, one of the things you got to do at that point in time was to choose the keynote speaker. And I chose Peter Drucker. And Peter didn't travel, so I, I had to, I said, let's do a video interview and we'll do that for the keynote because I really wanted to capture his thinking about quality because it actually never written on it specifically. And so I spent three days with him. And in that interview, one of the questions I asked was, I said, Peter, people are always coming to me to ask this question. How do you convince a leader to do quality? And his answer was this. First, he coughed. <coughs> he says, wrong question. I said, no, no, it's not the wrong question. Wrong question. Your leaders are smart people, hopefully. <laughs> that could be debatable in some cases. But the leaders are smart people. They wouldn't have got there if they hadn't been. Your job is to present them information with integrity. In other words, that the data we present them is actually meaningful and it says what they need to know. And then to be able to give them some understanding of the alternatives and then they have to choose based on that what's right for the strategic direction of the company. And, and I started realizing when I, I saw that is that Drucker was actually saying don't just give them anything and, and everything. You have to focus them. You have to teach them and lead them. So, so one of the things I'm doing now is, is yellow belt training for executives, but I don't teach them one single tool. I only teach them how to think about numbers, how to think about process, how to understand their obligation, what are the levels of maturity an organization can go through as it develops process, what are the linkages management has to put in place? And at the end, they have to make some choices. And one of those uh, exercises in there is a waste naming exercise. Don't accept the seven categories of waste. Where do you put pollution in there? You know, where do you put wasted energy? Name your own waste and come up with clear examples for what it means for your organization. And at the end, I say, okay, you also have to have an elevator speech. What are you going to do for the future? How will you define the quality that you want to have in your strategic intent? And then they finally go through uh, uh, another exercise, and that exercise is uh, how will they actually start uh, defining uh, issues that they want to go take a look at? How will you initiate projects? And so that's not what most organizations do for yellow belt training. Most organizations do yellow belt training and they start saying, oh, you have to have process mapping, blah, blah, blah. That's not what executives need. They need to learn how to read, interpret, and direct the strategy of the organization. Okay, wow, uh, thank you. Um, 
the uh, your your talks here are certainly valuable. We're getting a lot of tremendous comments from people. They they are enjoying this a lot. So many questions though that um, you know I I think maybe what we might have to do is to have them email you now. Greg's email is on the screen. Okay, so you may send an email to Greg to to cover this. So let's just uh, cover a few more closing items. Okay. Um,